Hello, world. Sean Atwood is the infamous author and activist who is banned from America for life. Sean made millions in the stock market in his early 20s, and by his 30s, he was running one of the biggest ecstasy empires in the U.S., smuggling more than $4 million worth of drugs into Arizona before he was raided and sentenced to 200 years in prison. Sean's biggest competitor in the ecstasy business was the mafia mass murderer Sammy the Bull Gravano whom we talk about on this episode. We also talk about Sean's views on insider stock market trading, as well as the recent stuff going on with Reddit, Robinhood, and GameStop. Sean has also done more research on the Epstein conspiracies than probably anyone. He's done hundreds of interviews with his victims and acquaintances, and he talks about his latest discoveries on the subject towards the end of this podcast. This conversation is packed with gems, and I hope you guys enjoy. Please welcome Sean Atwood. Hey now. Yo, yo. What's up, Ow! man? <laughs> nice to see you. Yeah, you too, man. Thank you. Great to see your channel going from strength to strength. How's it going, man? What have you been, what have you been up to? Man, this year has just saw amazing growth in the channel. But last year, I was down in the dumps because I think I may have told you some uh, stories about my uh, friend from childhood, Wild Man. And he died, and his funeral was just before Christmas. And he was co-interviewing people with me on my True Crime podcast. He was doing really well. He was thriving on YouTube. And then he got ill. He tried to get in the hospital. They said, Corona, stay at home. And he had breathing difficulties. And he went in, multiple organ failure. And he died within, like, you know, within a day of being admitted. Was, that, was it coronavirus? Is that what killed him? No, multiple organ failure. He didn't, he didn't have Corona. They just, well, you could say Corona killed him because when he tried to get in hospital, they said, stay at home. You know, it's coronavirus. If he'd have gone in and they put him on a drip and took care of him, but they estimate in this country, I think that um, thousands of people have died who have things wrong with them, who can't get in hospital because of the Corona. Yeah, that's insane. I've got his picture up there right behind me. The big guy. Right in the yellow shirt, there. that's him? That's him, yeah. He was the one who we went to America and he introduced me to all the mafia figures. That's how I got the criminal enterprise going because he's, you know, a big tough guy versus me, you know, just the, the, the skinny, nerdy business guy. So he opened that door into that world for me to set up the criminal enterprise. And when the SWAT team came, um, he was right there with me, protecting me, you know, in, in the neo Nazi jail. He's a very good person to get arrested with because he was running around that jail. When when we got off the, the the bus, there was like 13 co-defendants. We were arriving at Sheriff Joe Arpaio's Madison Street Jail horseshoe section. This is like a horseshoe formation of cells where you go in and you first get processed. And it's like Dante's Inferno in there. You are sardined into these cells. Everyone just sat on the floor squatting down. You try and like, get in there. Maybe there's a little bit of room near the toilet. And the reason there's the room near the toilet is because there's piss all over there and it stinks of shit. So you sit down there and then some big dude just gets on the toilet and takes a crap. And the whole cell, everyone's just like this, holding their noses. And they're all yelling, drop one, flush one, drop one, flush one. Because those toilets are really powerful, man. You press that button and it almost sucks your ass off. It's like a bee day spraying all this water right into your butt crack. So when you take a shit, the prison rule is drop one, flush one. So as soon as that log hits that fucking water, you're like. Vish, 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 vish. But anyway, in a cell, you know, like that, as those logs are dropping, the whole cell just stinks. And because it's the newly arrested people, you've got. People who've been in like fights with the cops, people who've been tasered and injured. You've got gangbangers from different street locations who are KOS on site. You've got homeless people. You've got people just fucked up on alcohol, fucked up on drugs. A lot of people going through the shock of the newly incarcerated. It's just mayhem. When those gangbangers come in who are like from rival neighborhoods, right away it just kicks off and there's blood splatter. Then the guards come in, they drag the assailants out 
And if they're kicking off, they put them in this thing called a restraint chair, and it looks like a medieval torture device. It is a black chair tilted back, and they strap you into it, all of your limbs, and if you, like, are mouthing off or spitting, they put a spit hood on your head, and you see people in these 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 chairs just rocking back and forth and, like, howling like cats and shit like that, like mental patients. So anyway, this is the absolute bedlam we arrived at shortly after we were all SWAT team raided May 16th, 2002. I said I had about 200 people working for me on one of the previous interviews I did with you. And um, they started to arrest those people in groups. So they had the continuous criminal enterprise, you know, the crime uh, family. Uh, they had like a pecking order. Now, at, I was at the top. Wild woman was number two. Wild man's girlfriend and wild man was number three so they had wild woman above wild man she was as tough as he was man if, if, if some people were more scared of her than him seriously their relationship it's it's uh you know it's um terrible that domestic violence exists in the world but their relationship was based on domestic violence you know it, i saw i saw the fight sometimes he'd hit her She'd grab a knife, stab him in the belly. Sometimes they'd be both be in hospital, but they were like cave people. I was saying, you guys are going to kill each other one of these days. And then the very next day, after having these fights, they'd be like, love you, love you. And it was all about the makeup sex, completely off the scale. So, wild woman, I'm setting the scene for what happens still when we get out of this van. Wild woman is from Liverpool. The accent is so thick in Liverpool they said that if there was, if it had gone to trial in Arizona, they would have had to get her an interpreter. So <laughs> I'll give you an example. Yala, gives a siggy. Have you any idea what that means? No. Yala, gives a siggy. What does that mean? What are you saying? That means, here you are, my lad. Give me a cigarette. <laughs> La is like mate. So she's like. <sighs> So they were, anyway, she was totally battle hardened, man. She was a big woman at one point in time, but she'd been hammering the crystal meth. And she was only tiny, but she was as tough as fuck. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you a story in a minute about what happened to the women when they actually got in there. So we're all getting out of this van. We've, I told you previously about the SWAT team raid. What happened next was they took us all to uh, Tempe police station. They, they built this outdoor processing center specifically for me and my co-defendants. So we're all getting processed at this outdoor processing center. Then they start filtering us over to Tempe jail. In Tempe jail, uh, I'm realizing the gravity of the situation because more, I'm thinking, right, you know, they've raided my house. I quit trafficking a year ago. There's no drugs. What can they do? Maybe they can release me. But as more people started to show up at the jail, um, I'll give you another example. One of my co-defendants, Cody Bates, mentioned previously that he's no longer with us. He was uh, ended up in a Scientologist rehab where they put him on antidepressants, which had a side effect of killing yourself, and he killed himself. It's documented. The lawsuit is online if people want to look that up. Cody Scientologist Bates. rehab? Yeah, yeah. Where? Uh, I don't know. Don't know, but it's, it's uh, uh, probably Arizona or California, I imagine. So Cody Bates shows up. Cody Bates was my right-hand man in charge of sensible things because he never got high. But after we all got arrested, he got so depressed, he went straight to heroin. Hence, he ended up in the rehab where he hung himself. So Cody Bates shows up, and this other guy shows up. I'll just call him the DJ. And we're sharing our arrest stories. So I tell them, you know, bam, 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 bam. Door flies off the hinges. SWAT team raid. Cody Bates is driving along the freeway and he looks up in the morning and sees the helicopter and he thinks this is a bit strange everywhere i'm going there seems to be a helicopter it's like that scene in goodfellas in the afternoon he's looking up and lo and behold he's he's been driving he's scared to go anywhere he's just driving he doesn't want to stop so he's, he's driving to phoenix tempe mesa going up and down these freeways afternoon lo and behold helicopter next thing he sees like a motorcade 
of police cars and, and police motorbikes. And they all just, just, he's got motorbikes all around him, cars, and they just take him off the road. That's how he got busted. Now, the DJ, it was his first day at his brand new job of some, as a fundraiser, as a fundraiser for the Republican Party. <laughs> <laughs> so he he shows up and um they come in his workplace and arrest him so i get, imagine that was the end of that all right so all day long we are just like sharing stories at the at the tempe jail and then there comes a point in time where the van comes to take us to sheriff joe arpaio's horseshoe and i'd heard stories about the horseshoe from wildman previously because He'd been deported multiple times. He was a menace to society. And it would always end up with him in the horseshoe. And um, it's a horseshoe formation. You go in, you go through the cells. You don't know whether it's night or day because it's underground, but the walls do heat up. So you can detect, you know, when, when, when it's midday. And you come out at the very end and they give you a classification, minimum, medium, max security, give you black and white stripes and you get on your way. So I knew some stories about the horseshoe. Wildman said last time he was in, they wouldn't give them his name. He was in there for days and you can't sleep because you're so sardined into those cells. So we get in the van and I finally see Wildman for the first time since my arrest. And he said that when he was in the Tempe jail, they were trying to interview my girlfriend, Claudia, and he was walking past and he heard him say, these are very serious charges you're facing. You need to tell us about Atwood. And he, he somehow he broke free of the of the, the policeman that, that, that was taking him to where he was taking from. Managed to get stick his head in the room where Claudia was getting interrogated and goes, serious fucking charges, my fucking ass. Don't listen to these daft pig bastards, Claudia. And then he just goes, ha, 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 And he had this big fuck-off Vikings beard. And he's been up for days on smoking crack and crystal meth. And he just looks like an absolute maniac. So we're in the van sharing our, our arrest stories and um, speaking to the females now because the females are with us. First group was about 13 co-defendants. About half female so when we get to the Madison Street Jail, there's like a ladder, uh, steps coming out the van, and the transportation officers tell the women to get out first. Now there's a huge line of people waiting to go into the jail. These are all like the new arrestees. Like I described earlier, people, you know, have just been in altercations with the police, people who are drunk, people who are high, people who've been tasered, people who've got injuries. And, and as they see these women coming off the van, this big line of men turns around and starts heckling the women. And I can't remember specifically what they were saying, but it was of a sexual nature. So the women, you know, wild woman who's very tough, was just, you know, just looking at these guys, like assessing the situation. But the other women looked like they were really in, feeling really insulted and disrespected. So then the men start to get out of the van and the guards just yelling at everybody to get out, get down these steps very quickly. So wild man just stops on the top step and the, you know, the, the, the cops tell him to get down. He just doesn't move. And he raises his Vikings beard and he opens his eyes really wide and he looks at all of the men heckling the women and he goes, Hey, that there's my fucking woman. I'll have fucking any of you guys when we get inside there in a couple of minutes because that's where we're all fucking going. If you guys don't shut the fuck up right now, you're going to see what's going to happen to you. And they all just shut the fuck up right away. Holy shit. He was a good man to get arrested with. Yeah, he was 28 stone um, by the end of it. And um, one stone is 14 
pounds, I believe. What did you say it was? 28 stone? That was his weight. Let me just tell you, 14 times 28. So he was he was 400 pounds in weight and six foot two. Oh my god. And his, his his fists were twice the size of mine. And it was just all human teeth marks all the way along them. Now it might be um it might be an interesting subject to go and might be Sammy the Vault because he's on YouTube now and all of all, anything with him on it is going viral. What was the what was the story behind all that? Let's let's get into that. Let me just tell you one more thing. So we had a guy working for us called let's say Handsome Mark, and he started working for the Gravano Enterprise. So he was playing both sides, and one of our customers gave Handsome Mark money for a thousand ecstasy but handsome mark went and got it off the gravano enterprise instead of us not only that he was pulled over by the feds and the pills were confiscated so then the customer comes to us well she went to wild man first i hadn't authorized what he'd done he just went and did it himself so she goes to wild man and says look just gave you know one of your guys it's 10 plus thousand. He's saying that he got pulled over. There's no pills. There's nothing he could do about it. So Wildman went and paid him a visit. And um, Wildman just like, he only needs to punch someone once. And he would usually knock him out. So in this case, he punched the guy. And it ended up with the guy's tooth stuck in between two of his knuckles. So by the time I get there, he's explaining, you know, I've just... This guy was fucking going through Sammy the Bull. This is what happens to people who go through Sammy the Bull. He's showing me his, his fucking, his damaged, his damaged fist. Was the tooth still like dangling out of his flesh? It wasn't still dangling, but his knuckles were all fucked up. Oh my God. Yeah, by the time I got, I got up there, it, it, was, it was later. So um, one of the people Wildman was going to retaliate against online was Sammy the Bull because of what he said. And um, basically, you know, I got trolled a lot last year as my channel has grown, as I've done more about Epstein and sexual abuse and exposing the elite. The trolls are getting more organized against me. They've yeah, you're, you're, you're in this sort of like weird <sighs> universe of conspiratorial shit that most people don't know is, exists. And then some people are aware of it. They think, oh, you're just... You, if you look that deep into something, you're you're a fucking cuckoo, or it's just like you're in this like this weird little world of like underground criminal conspiracy stuff. So it's easy, I think, to put you in a, a certain category, and just like write you off. So the trolls contacted everybody from my past life to try and find holes in my story. They contacted my prosecutor. They contacted Sammy the Bull. They've contacted all of my ex-girlfriends. They've contacted everybody I've ever written about or put a photo up about or anybody they can find a photo of me with on social media. They've contacted all of my podcast guests. They've contacted... I mean, this is just like insanity. These people have... These mentally ill people have so much time on their hands. And it's, it's insane. So obviously they contacted Sammy the Bull and said, look, you know, Sean Atwood... He's made his career, you know, by talking shit about you. Are you going to do something about it? So Sammy the Bull got on a camera and said, "This Sean Atwood, if he's, you know, if you fuck, I'm hearing he's a journalist and he's a TV guy in England. He's saying he's built his career off of my name. Um, I don't, you know, I've never heard of the guy. He's full of shit. And if I'd have bumped heads with him in Arizona." I'd be picking his bones out of my teeth. That's what would have happened to him. So, so anyway, I had to laugh. And I'd like to set the record straight right now about this Sammy the Bull situation. And this is a clip that I think will do really good for you because this is so viral. And first thing I'd like to say is I had so many aliases when I was running my ecstasy enterprise the prosecutor said she couldn't even put them all on my grand jury indictment. So if someone says to Sammy the Bull, who's the Sean Atwood guy, how the hell is he going to know who Sean Atwood is? Because I was just a shadowy figure 
running this thing without my real name ever being known to anybody. So that's the first thing I'd like to say. Second thing I'd like to say is I love Sammy the Bull's YouTube channel. I've sent so many people over there. He is a master storyteller. Reminds me of two Tonys who protected me in prison. There are so many people out there who can't tell a story. And he is, I'm riveted. I've been watching it. And he's, he's, he's part of a generation. And there's not many of that generation still alive, these iconic Italian mafia figures. So, you know, hats off to him for that. Next thing I'd like to say is that they, they handcuffed Wildman to Gerard Gravano in Towers Jail in 2002, 2003, which is Sammy the Bull's son. Now, on the streets, you know, a lot of people have been saying they were working for the Bull, for Sammy. And I think I previously gave you my story of the, the guys I met in Tucson, who my uh, bisexual, lesbian, porn star wife was dating one of their girlfriends. We met them. I sat down with them and I said, it's the feds we need to worry about, not each other. You guys are lighting the place up. Uh, you know, we need you need to chill. And there's plenty of demand for XE. We could coexist. The, the piece didn't last long. My top sales guy, Skinner, so one click from the Gravano Enterprise, enticed him to a nightclub in Scottsdale under the pretext of doing a deal with him. They took him into the men's room and knocked his teeth out and took all of his... Uh, money and all of his drugs and after that i moved onto that property Sinvacus, catalina foothills tucson arizona in the gated gated guarded community so to of you know as an added layer of protection against gravano's crew at the same time i had a female who had penetrated into the gravano household was attending barbecues over there was giving me you know the layout um, we, we did some drive-bys on the street and um, telling me about, you know, the associates, what they look like and who was over the, you know, all these steroid head jock guys in the train and the track suits um, sports were um, at these barbecues with the Gravanos. Um, so that's where it was at on the streets with the Gravanos. And people are saying, because Sammy the Bulls is said I'm full of shit, he never knew me. I'm completely making all of this up. But if you go to the police reports, or if you go to the Phoenix New Times article, it says that I was Sammy the Bulls competitor in the XC market. And I had, was established for so long that because I'd done it for years, Gravano just came in, lit the place up, got arrested. I made him look like a flash in the pan. Now that's coming from the cops and the local media, and people can, you know, verify that independently. Sammy has recently said that he wasn't even running the XC Enterprise. So the question is, were all these people working for the Gravano Enterprise just throwing his name out there saying he was the boss? Or, you know, were they actually working for him? And for whatever legal reasons, he's unable to say that. Back to Towers Jail, 2002, 2003. So Sammy the Bulls crew, they get arrested a um, couple of years before my crew. I'm like, thanks, cops. You just wiped out the competition. But all those resources that were on Gravano were then put onto me. Uh, May 16, 2002, that was when the SWAT team came. So they are running through the court process a couple of years before we are. So when the guards knowingly chained Gerard Gravano to Wildman. They did that on purpose because they wanted to see what would happen. They knew there was two crews that had beef on the streets. Now, Wildman looks at me like, what should I do? And I said, because, you know, we don't want to get any more charges. These guys have probably got some good legal information for us. They're ahead of the curve on this. They've been going through this for a couple of years. We should just sit down with him find out what the tricks are the prosecutors are playing on them, you know, and how all this shit works. And that's what we did. We sat there all night with Sammy the Bull's son um, before we went to our court hearing. And we were fine with him, and I'm fine with him to this day. And the trolls have contacted him too, but he has acknowledged that he does know who I am. And he was sentenced for, as one of the uh, dominant uh, leaders 
of the ecstasy ring. So it's it's you know it's a hundred percent that Gerard Gravano was near the top of whoever was running the ecstasy ring, whether the dad was or whether he wasn't. And prior to us meeting Gerard in the jail, my homie G Dog, who I told you last time and introduced me to his brothers in La M.A., where they had the rocket propelled grenade launcher on the TV. G Dog had, I don't know whether he'd been a cellmate with Gerard Gravano or he'd gone to, into his cell previously and spoke to him when they first got arrested, this was, and said, look, you know, don't fuck with English Sean and Peter because we've got his back. So that's how they knew who, who was protecting us, or at least Gerard did. And then, you know, down the road, I've, I've kept in touch with him um, on email. It's been it's been years now since we had any last communication. But those guys all went to Hollywood. They're doing the straight and narrow thing. Mob Wives became that hit TV show. So, you know, kudos to Karen Gravano for pulling that off. And I've read her book, and I, I, I love her book. And I think what they're doing right now is uh, they're on the positive track. I offered to pay for Sammy the Bull Gravano to fly to London so we could sit down and have a uh, podcast recorded professionally here in London. That would have been a huge thing. Um, And people say, well, you only said that because you know he can't travel because he's got this criminal record. But we did the same thing with John Elite, mafia hitman for the Gambinos. You know, he admits to being involved in multiple murders. And he came to the UK and me and Wildman sat down with him. And that's one of the most watched videos on the channel. So that offer is still open. Uh, If Sammy the Bull wants to come to London, we would love to sit down with him and get this filmed professionally. And if he's got any questions for me, I'd like to set that record straight because I'm not full of shit. It's fully documented what we've done. And there's, you know, the, the, the police uh, recently, I had to re get my story re verified through a TV company I'm doing something with. It was already verified by National Geographic. They had to see my paperwork in the beginning for Locked Up Abroad. And I'm looking at the, uh, the paperwork recently. It's, you know, it's right there about some of the witness statements, the 10 witness statements that led to me getting arrested were people who were playing both sides. And, oh, they were just working for Sammy. But then they told the cops they were working for me and started to give them all this information up, hoping to reduce their own sentences. All 57 of Sammy the Bull's co-defendants agreed to cooperate. We had over 100 and only four agreed to cooperate because we were tight. Wow. Yeah. That's fucking insane. That would be a great yeah. conversation, I feel like, between you and him. Two big competing ecstasy enterprises back in the back in the same era in Arizona. That would be yeah. amazing. Has he... Love- has he answered you at all? Has have you reached? You've reached out to him. Obviously, has he responded? Yeah, I reached out to him through a person who represents him, rather than doing any silly online stuff. And that person said presently he's not going to do it. Really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But he he said he's focusing on his channel, and his channel is doing great. And if you like those old school mafia stories, of, you know, dark tales of of blood and guts, uh, with gallows humor. I urge people to go over to Sammy the Bull's channel and check those stories out. Couldn't you guys just do one of these Zoom things? Yeah, but it's not, you know, all my Zoom things have not been as effective in terms of reach versus having my camera crew there. Yeah, they're not the same. They're just not. Like, it's it, it's really weird. You can't really, like, connect and build, like, a rapport with somebody, and they, they don't, like, naturally last as long. Like, podcast people come in the studio they always go over two hours, two and a half hours, no problem. But when it's like this, like we always hit a wall for some reason, no matter who I'm talking to on the computer. I'm staring at a fucking screen, man. It does your eyes in. It does. Yeah, yeah, it really does. So like, all right, let's go. I want to talk about before you went into the ecstasy business, you were huge in the stock market. You were making millions of dollars, you know, buying and selling and, and uh, executing stock options now this shit, this shit is so confusing why is the stock market and obviously it's a it's a huge it's a topical subject right now with all the GameStop stuff going on and and the hedge funds that you know were billions of dollars in the hole because of GameStop but can you explain for 
for dummies like myself. What is a stock option and how is a stock option relevant or how is a stock option? What is a stock option compared to these bets on companies like GameStop failing when they bet on a company failing like this? And, and how does it work? Okay, so let me just say that what I'm about to say, I need to do a disclaimer now because there's laws against giving investment advice. So this is just going to be educational information I'm going to give based on my experience in the stock market from age 14. So I have, what, 10, 20, 36, 37 years experience in the stock market. I was trading options in my late teens and in my 20s, I was a licensed stockbroker. I was a licensed, had the options license, and I had a branch manager license uh, in the 1990s. This was in Arizona, working as a stockbroker. So they're my qualifications. So the stock market is an absolute minefield. And people who go in who don't have a clue what they're doing will just get their legs blown off very quickly. 90 something percent of new investors just get completely bled dry. So stay away from it if you do not know what you are doing. Stocks, you know, you buy, let's say, Tesla and it goes up 10 percent and you sell Tesla and you make 10 percent profit. Let's say you buy Tesla, it goes down 10 percent and you sell Tesla and you lose 10% of your capital. Now with options, if Tesla goes up 10% and you own a call option, it might go up 100% or 200%, depending upon how geared that call option is. If Tesla goes down 10%, you may lose 100% of your investment depending upon how geared that call option is. Flip that over now to put options. Put options are when you're betting it's going to go down. Tesla goes down 10%. Your put option may go up 100%. Tesla goes down 10%. I'm sorry, Tesla goes up 10%. Your put option may get be completely wiped out. You may lose 100%. So... The easiest way to think of options is as geared investments. When an underlying security moves a fraction of a percent, an option is going to swing wildly depending upon various factors, which include the exercise price, the exercise date, the volatility of the underlying security, and so on and so on. Now, if you want to capitalize on the demise of a company and the fall of its stock price. There are two ways to do it. You either buy put options or you sell it short. So the short sellers on GameStop, for example. Wait, what is the difference between selling it short or buying a put option? So put options are called derivative securities. And with a put option, you, you can make a very small investment and and it's so it's geared so tremendously that your capital can go up hundreds of percent very quickly or you can be wiped out very quickly now selling short has got nothing to do with derivative securities to sell short you have to pony up the full capital to collateralize that trade i'll give you an example Say you're a short seller on GameStop at $5 and you want to sell short 10,000 shares. 10,000 times five is $50,000. Depending upon your relations with your broker is what determines how much you must put up to collateralize that trade. But when I, back in the 90s, you had to put up at least 50%. So I sell short $50,000 worth of GameStop at $5, and I put up $25,000 as collateral. Now, the people see 
that GameStop has got a huge amount of short selling on it. And the people think, hey, this is a good opportunity for a short squeeze. Now, what a short squeeze means is they just buy shares because of the large short interest, knowing that if they drive the shares up, the short sellers are going to get a margin call and then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy when they buy their shares back to cover their margin call that it, it sends it even higher and even more short sellers are triggered to buy their shares back. Go back to the guy who put 25000 down. GameStop goes from five to six. So now he's down 10000 So his collateral has shrunk to 15000 GameStop goes to seven. Now his collateral has shrunk to 5,000 because he's down 20,000. At some point, he gets a call from his broker saying, you need to send us money if you want to maintain this position. And that's called a minimum margin requirement. It might be a third of the underlying value of the short sale. But whatever it is, it's getting triggered Every single time that stock goes up. Now, let's say it goes to 10 and he's down 50 grand and he's got no money left. Do you know what he has to do now? He has to buy the shares back and eat the loss. And when he buys those shares back, what does that do? Sends the shares higher. So a guy who got wiped out at 10, he might buy it back, send it, sends it to 11. And then the guys who are wiped out 11, they have to buy it back and they send it to 12. And then those guys, 13, and off it goes to outer space. And that's exactly what you saw with GameStop. To the moon. To the moon, Alice. <laughs> oh my God. What was your reaction when you saw this happening? Okay, so... I, um, this is your world, man. This is your yeah. you used to live in this. I've seen this these things happen so many times, so it was no surprise to me. But what it, what it is symptomatic of is a, is an overheating market. So we we saw the Corona crash, then we saw the Feds just put in the mon monetary methadone, and that as lower interest rates has just sent <laughs> everything skyrocketing. And then there's a saying in the stock market: when your barber starts recommending an investment it's time to get the hell out because that means there's no more suckers left to put their money in and that's what we've got the froth we're at the froth level right now psychology however can take things to extremes so that is why it's so hard to call a top when i went on true geordie about three years ago i said look bitcoin way overvalued all it is is computer code I think it's going to go down. And it did. It went down to about from 20,000 to three to 4,000. Recently, it broke back above 20,000. Now, that's called a technical breakout. And when something does break above an old high, there's no limit as to how high psychology could take it. So we saw it, wham, right up to 40,000. It's got as high as 44,000 today. Could go to 100. I still think Bitcoin is worthless. This is psychology driving the market. It's a millennial bubble. But how high does it go in the meantime? Because I think it's worthless, do I sell it short at 45,000, at 50,000? No, I certainly do not. Because like I said, you never know how high it's going to go when psychology takes over. Let's roll the clock back now to Holland. Tulip mania hundreds of years ago. People were remortgaging their houses to buy tulip bulbs. Tulip bulbs were more valuable than gold. And that's just the effects of crowd psychology. If people are interested in this, there's two books I read as a kid. And one is Le Bon, The Crowd. And the other is Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds by Charles McKay. Because when I got interested in the stock market at 14, I went down Witness Library and ordered dozens of books on the subject. And I quickly learned 
This is not a pure mathematical thing. It is a crowd psychology thing. And once you tune into that, you can learn how to ride those trends. And the other thing I would recommend to people is a book called The Secrets for Profiting in Bull and Burr Markets by Stan Weinstein. I had that one read as a teenager. I must have read it about 10 times. And later in life, when I was a top producing stockbroker, Stan Weinstein, guru, actually started mentoring me over the phone. I was one of his corporate clients. Uh, every time, you know, he called the office because he was on Wall Street Week and that he was this, this this big figure in that world. All the brokers were looking at me like it, like you know, Stan Weinstein's on the phone. There's also a forum that discusses and puts out stock selections based exclusively on Stan Weinstein's methodology, and that is called StageAnalysis.net, of which I am a member. And I think the last thing I posted on that was that Zoom had done a technical breakout uh, around the beginning of the corona. I didn't buy any myself. God, I wish I had. If you look at the subscriber growth in Zoom numbers and the share price jump, I mean, that is definitely a company that is going places in terms of revenue and earnings per share growth, which is which, what drives um, companies' values. The short sellers on GameStop looked at the financials. They hadn't made money in years. They're still losing money now. So that valuation in the billions had no resemblance to reality. But these things are never a straight line. The people who buy them on the hype end up just getting wiped. And these things have to return to the fair market value eventually. That's called the efficient market hypothesis. And the fair market value is based on the discounted cash flow and earnings of everything that the company is going to make in the future. And people say, well, look, if the short sellers are buying all the, you know, the short squeezers are buying all the shares, how on earth are the shares ever going to come down? Well, what happens is the company can issue more shares at any time. And they often do when share prices go up that high. The insiders start to sell all of their shares. They can't believe their luck. They've got shares at almost zero, millions of them. And next thing, it's gone from five to what, almost 50? And they're, they're inside a share. Believe me, they are filing reports to sell their shares as quick as possible. So these things are flashes in the pan. The stock market will always go back to a fair market value at some point. But in the meantime, psychology creates these huge swings, which if you can read the trends and forecast the trends, you can capitalize on those swings. Why do you think Bitcoin is worthless? Don't you think the concept of Bitcoin and having a currency that's not able to be manipulated by the federal government or by billionaire hedge funds, billion dollar hedge funds, don't you think that's a good idea? Absolutely. I completely agree. So what is the value of a commodity, you know, um, exchange value, um, industrial value, portability, transferability, now, and supply. So look at the value of gold. You know, there's only much, so much supply of gold in the world. Look at the value of, uh, you know, any other precious asset. Bitcoin has the flagship factor but anyone can create a cryptocurrency. So the supply is potentially unlimited for people creating cryptocurrencies. Surely someone else can create a cryptocurrency with all the same exact same attributes as Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. The supply is potentially infinite. It's not something you're mining out of the ground that industry is going to use that has this actual value. And, you know, eventually the governments will capitalize on that um, weakness in cryptocurrencies, I believe, to bring the values back down. Well, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not a fan of the government. I'm all for it, everything that you just said. But I just think that it's a psychological bubble created by millennials and perpetuated by millennials 
and it, it's going to have to come crashing down at some point. But right now it is on a red hot tide. It's going to the moon, Alice. <laughs> yeah, it's at like forty two thousand last time I checked. I think it was this yeah. morning. It's insane. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I've even talked to, you know, lots of Bitcoin experts and they all say, don't invest in it. Just use it as something to, to you know, if you can do transactions with it casually, you know what I mean? Not if you think about a lot of people say, if you think about investing in Bitcoin, just just picture yourself throwing it away or lighting that money on fire. If you want, if you wanted like if somebody owes you some money for a service and they they happen to have Bitcoin, ask them to pay you in Bitcoin. But don't take a bunch of your money and put it into there because it's basically just like burning it. I saw that news story recently. I think it was the German authorities arrested a fraudster that had like tens of millions of Bitcoin and he wouldn't give them the password so they can't access it. But they've, they've kind of like done something so he can't access it either. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, that's a cool thing about Bitcoin. The government can't take your money away no matter what yeah. you've done. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> You talked about there was like a wake up moment for you when you were in the stock market that kind of brought you into this world of activism and being outspoken about America's darkest, dirtiest secrets. And that yeah, was the, the, the 9 11 insider options trading. Yeah. Can you break that? I know you've talked about it before, but for people that are watching this one, can you kind of like break down like how you experienced that and, and how you discovered everything that went down? Yeah. So, I've already explained what a put option is. Right. Just to clarify, in case you're going to make a clip, a put option is a derivative security whereby if the underlying security moves a small percentage, the put option will move a massive percentage. And with puts, you're betting that the underlying security is going to go down. It's the opposite of a call option. In the days before 9-11... The average daily volume of the put options on the airlines went through the bloody roof when 9-11 happened and the stock market was halted and the stock market was reopened days later and the underlying securities had collapsed. Those put options had gone up thousands of percents. Small investments were worth millions. It was headline news. It's on YouTube. You, you can find it about insider option trading. And the guy said on the headline news in America, this has to be the terrorists. The only people who could possibly know were the terrorists. This is insider terrorist trading. These trades will be traced and we will find out who these bastards are. Paraphrasing, of course. So it completely disappears out of the news. Now, you know, options is something I've been on for many years of my life. I'm thinking, what is going on with this? This is insane. I've never seen anything like this before in my life. Headline news, push, gone. Years later, I'm in a maximum security Madison Street Jail, Phoenix, Arizona, reading a book by David Icke, I think. Perhaps Alice in Wonderland, 9-11. And his, his research had found that those trades had been traced to a brokerage that was run by XCIA. So not only had they known about it, they had profited from it everybody who knew about those trades at the time was visited by the feds and deputized which meant if you ever speak to these trades about anyone outside of this interview today you are going to prison for years of your life so that completely i mean if people google it i've not put out all the names involved but if people google it you can see all the names involved. I don't want to get it too complicated for people, um, but it gets really deep. Now, is there actual proof that there's ex-CIA people that were in charge of the banks that were doing these trades? Oh, yeah. Is oh, this yeah. some, like, because I know David Icke, he, I mean, talk about being connected to some batshit craziness. I know he's connected to some crazy shit. Yeah, I agree 100%. Every time got... you see him and his name, that people are talking about reptilians and stuff. 
I agree 100% that David has some conspiracy theories that people would consider crazy, but this has been verified by a number of other independent researchers as well. Okay. Um, it's been discussed on RT quite a lot, and um, I urge people to go on, go online and check it out themselves. Um, I'm just putting it in right now on my computer to try and get the name of that brokerage. Uh, Max Kaiser, he's the guy who's done a lot on it, on RT. Max Kaiser, because he was involved with those brokers as well. Here we go. Um, Max Kaiser and guests talk about 9-11 inside the trading. Oh, yeah, here it is. Here it is. Right. So it was, it was very obvious that advanced knowledge of the attacks was circulating amongst traders. And this insider trading happened days leading up to the attacks. Buzzy Krongard, K-R-O-N-G-A-R-D, deputy chairman of the CIA, was the former head of Alex Brown. And Alex Brown was the company that had... I think the majority of the options transactions went for them. This says, I used to work for Buzzy, Alex Brown. I still keep in touch with my former colleagues, some of whom were buzzing about the action in the put options on the airlines. Additionally, a company I started in LA, a dot-com, had been sold to Wall Street brokerages a few months before the attacks. And the company had relocated their acquisition to the top floor of the World Trade Center. I was in touch with employees who were also buzzing about the put option frenzy in airline stocks. And they cited Alex Brown as, as a major source. I urge people to research it. Um, there's a lot more names involved. There's a lot more companies involved. And there are some articles that really lay it down. But just off the top of my head right now, I can't find them. It's fucking crazy, man. It's, <laughs> that shit is some, that's some terrifying stuff. And, and no one, it's something that no one really talks about. Because the people who were, did the trades would go to prison. And it goes right against, you know, what was it Pink Floyd said? Mother, should I trust the government? <laughs> the government does not want you to hear it. Mainstream media is owned by, you know, the same corporations who own the government. There you go. You're not going to get it apart from independent researchers here and there. My whole, like, overview of this whole situation with the stock market is that the normalization of the internet and everyone having access to so much information and everyone just living on these on these devices 24 seven, it's made, it's made it harder for the government and corporations to keep secrets, you know, and it, it's kind of, it's made everything more transparent, which is made like previously, like if you even go 10 years ago when, or 20 years ago when no one had iPhones or people weren't living on the computer on, online, I'm sure far less, far less, people understood the stock market than they do today and now because of something like this because now you have this crazy news story about a bunch of kids on reddit that are manipulating and making these people lose billions now everybody wants to learn how the stock market works and it's gonna it's gonna shine a light on all this shady shit that happens all the time that's normal for the stock market okay so what you said about technology advancing is true but with the stock market there's nothing new under the sun so when you see this deluge of novices wanting to learn about the stock market, we saw exactly the same thing during the dot-com bubble. And we know when that deluge happens that the stock market is getting near a top because who's left to buy after those, what the professionals would view as idiots. Once that last wave of money comes in from your barber, from your granny, from you know whoever little reddit investors once all that money's in who else is left then to sell shares to because the insiders are constantly unloading stock on novice investors it's a disinformation game when you read something in uh online or in a financial publication that says this company's doing great you should buy shares in it that Information is being put out there because someone is trying to sell you the shares. Insiders are constantly just pumping news stories out, 
telling you how great they're doing, how strong our earnings growth is, how sales revenue is going to go through the roof in the coming years. We've got contracts with China. All these stories are coming out all the time to suck people into buying the shares they are selling to them. For every buyer, there's a seller. And when that last wave of suckers comes in, it's getting near a market top. And those people, you know, your barbers, your shoe shine person, when they get wiped, they'll go back to doing what they're doing and they'll wish they never got involved in the stock market in the first place. I see it over and over again. Such a crazy game. It's just like going to the casino. I've never yeah. been I've never been into it. I've never bought shares and in, like individual pick I've never like individually picked stocks or day trade or whatever. You know, just like uh, you know, index funds or whatever, passive stuff, but man, it's there, addicting once you once you get into that, you start like watching it every day, watching your numbers go up and down. Short-term trading definitely. So, again, this is just an educational video. This is not investment advice. If you put some money away every month, in a fund that's highly rated and is safe, over time, you'll see that go up and down, up and down. But over time, you will make a much higher rate of return than you would than having that money just parked in the bank at a very low interest rate. But you've got to be able to stomach those ups and downs. If you're putting the money in every month, you're doing what's dollar cost averaging. So when it goes down, you buy more automatically when it goes up you buy less but your growth is right there that's the sensible way to do it for novice investors yeah i think that's even what uh, in, an, in an interview that i watched which made me decide to start doing this warren buffett they asked him what he would do if he was not in his position or whatever he would do he said the biggest return with the least downside is put all my money in in, in the s&p 500 over whatever however many years 50 60 70 years but you're not going to lose on that because the s&p 500 is the biggest corporations who are run by the biggest psychopaths who are getting the biggest government contracts because of that thing called bribery. Oh, sorry, political contributions. That's what keeps all that in motion. That's another thing is, is politics is becoming so much more transparent. People are uh, like media, like we're doing now, like politicians are able to go on here and, and talk to people for hours. There's some that don't do it, obviously, but there's some that do do it and, and they're upfront about everything. And it, it's hard to smear somebody by taking them out of context nowadays, because if they do something long form unedited like this, you can always go back and find the source if you're not lazy. So I feel like that's changing too. And I don't, I just, I guess I'm optimistic about the future of like politics and, and corrupt institutions of this country. Now that everything is becoming more transparent, it seems like in the last couple of years. Yeah. But look at those of us who are exposing the corruption and what we're having to go through you know, ranging from trolls to black uh, ops level stuff to take us down. Look at what Julian Assange is going through. He sacrificed his life to shine a light on that corruption to get to the truth. Uh, once you get so many followers, they take you out, don't they? Or they destroy your character. They used to assassinate you, but now they destroy your character or they put you in prison and give you a life sentence or they just hold you indefinitely like Julian Assange. So they still, the old guard still have techniques to combat what's going on with technology. And look at the Great Wall of China. Look at how, you know, those poor bastards over the, the, the suppression of information that's going on. So I don't want to be uh, too negative here, but yeah, that's that's my response to that. No, and, and another thing, it's, it's also insane to realize looking at the state of America right now and look at everyone's view on China. Like everyone, like I think by and large, the general view of China over here is like China is this crazy communist place. There's no freedom. You know, all the protests that are going on, all the terrible things that happened in China, but look how old China is. I had a guy on here that was recent, recently telling me a story, how he was over there doing a tour and someone was showing him a mill or something like an old mill that that made that made some sort of fabric or whatever. And they're like, you see that thing? That thing's older than America. 
<laughs> and he's like, what America's going through right now, China went through thousands of years ago. So I, I don't know. It's just, it, it puts everything in such perspective to realize how, you know, it's an ancient civilization with so much history and they've arrived where they are now. But look at some of the modern cities now. They look like uh, things from Flash Gordon, don't they? They're so advanced. Yeah. So Maxwell. Yeah, let's talk about Ghislaine Maxwell. <laughs> Last time we talked about Ghislaine Maxwell, uh, she had, I think, just been arrested. And we were kind of, you were kind of uh, telling your thoughts on what you think was going to happen to her. A lot of what we said has unfolded. When Maxwell got arrested, the more conspiratorial were saying that the fix was already in. You know, she would get a pass somehow and she would be let off so as to not name all of these people, her co-conspirators, royalty, people at the head of business, etc. But we've seen in the courts, month after month, motion after motion, go against her. She offered a multi- million dollar bail bond package and the judge shut that down she revealed that she's she's married and i think it was 25 million and the prosecutor said you know she's got multiple citizenship france uh, israel the uk and that money you know, if she's facing life sentence, she could just easily walk away from it. We don't know how deep her pockets are, but we believe the money that she said her husband was putting up was her money in the beginning. So, you know, it's probably chunk change to her uh, with her assets she's got around the world. Then we saw, as well as the denial of the bail bond, which has been going back and forth, we saw the authorities putting increased pressure on Prince Andrew to cooperate in this. And he's still reneging. And towards the end of the year, we saw two other huge players, one in the Epstein case, one in a case of his own. I'm talking about Jean-Luc Brunel. Jean-Luc Brunel got arrested in France. Epstein had boasted he had slept with over a 1,000 girls from Jean-Luc Brunel's pipeline from Europe to America including 12-year-old triplets, and he was laughing at what good oral sex they had given him on his birthday as this present from Jean-Luc Brunel. So I've been doing a series of interviews with a guy called Fred on my channel. He's out of France. He might be a good one for you to get on, who's an absolute expert in Jean-Luc Brunel. So he's at the forefront of this group of activists in France who are exposing this bastard, Virginia has said that at the orgy on the island in which Prince Andrew was participating, this is Virginia's words, in which Maxwell was participating and Epstein, that they were joking that these girls that Jean-Luc Brunel had sent over were the easiest ones. They couldn't even speak any English. And they were from these poor families in Eastern Europe. Jean-Luc Brunel was running a modeling agency and, you know, they tell these girls, we're going to launch a career, come with us. And next thing, they're getting sex trafficked. So the French authorities as well are leaning on Prince Andrew to give information. Now, is Prince Andrew, you know, and these other big names, the sleeve Maxwell's got up her, the car that Maxwell's got up her sleeve, even if she does, it would be in the interest of national security to prevent that information from ever coming out. We're talking about Bill Clinton, Prince Andrew, multi-billionaires, uh, Leon Black. It's come out since our last interview. Uh, gave Epstein $150 million. So Epstein, when he died, his net worth was around half a billion. Leon Black, who manages one of the biggest funds in the world, gave Epstein $150 million. A lot of that money must have gone to the sex trafficking. So, he, you know, he, directly his money was going into the sex trafficking of these kids, but nothing's been done to him. So there are these huge names that seem to be untouchable. So 
The trial is scheduled for this summer. And what Maxwell has been doing is going to court every month and trying to increase her plea bargaining power because right before the trial, each side then will try and get together and based on the plea bargaining power of the defendant, a deal will be agreed to avoid trial. I think that is the most likely outcome. It might not necessarily happen right before this summer trial date because that summer trial date is like a musical chair. They could push that back three months, six months. They can keep going with that. But at some point, I believe that Maxwell will have to take a plea bargain. So what does that mean? She has to take a plea bargain. Let's say she'd won all of these motions and she had a really strong plea bargaining power just before the trial. They might offer her like five to 10. So she gets up in front of the judge, shows remorse, and she's got all these mitigating circumstances. The judge has had a nice breakfast that day. He's not, you know, he's in a good mood. The judge might sentence her to the lower end of that range. So if she's got five to 10, the judge might give her six years. If she's going to court every month and all the motions are going against her and more witnesses are found and more charges are added to the indictment, she is losing her plea bargaining power. So by the time it gets to trial, they may say, look, the position you're in right now, the best we could do is offer you 15 to 20. Now she's going to say, right, 15 to 20, if I get 15, it's the feds. I serve 85% of that time. You know, the best years of my life are over. So I'm going to roll the dice and take it to trial. And I'm going to name these people. But at that point, the intelligence agencies would come in and say, look, national security, you can't go there. So these are the forces behind the scene at play. I've interviewed various people, and they believe that Maxwell is sat on the biggest treasure trove of political capital in the history of the world in terms of who Epstein filmed or recorded having sex with these trafficked girls. So if, if, you know, if, she, if she's got stuff on the Clintons, um, royal family members, whatever it is, if she feels so trapped that she's going to lose the rest of her life, she might want to activate that treasure trove and use that as some kind of bargaining power. But Biden has come in. So we've seen the changing of the guard in the White House. Biden and the Clinton crime family are like that. So we believe that Biden coming in will benefit Maxwell because that information will not be allowed to come out under a Biden presidency with him at the top of the feds. And again, just like the title of part one, there's always the possibility that Maxwell will get epstein What are they doing supposedly to prevent that? She has a whole floor of the jail to herself. Yep. She's not in a general population of prisoners. She's asked to be moved to a general population of prisoners so she can be around people and have those benefits. But because of the nature of her crimes the inmate population is likely to, at the very least, attack and extort her, or maybe even possibly kill her. She's been checked by guards continuously. She's saying that, you know, they're waking her up when she's asleep, checking that she's still alive, and the place is cameraed up like crazy. Just this week, her she started to fight back, and her lawyers filed something in the courts, and they're saying that, the only reason that she's been arrested was because of the failings in the Epstein case, because of his death, and that embarrassed the government. So to show that they're doing the job, they've gone after her, and she should have been arrested a long time ago if they had a case against her. But I don't buy into that at all. When they arrest someone in a case of this magnitude and complexity, the bureaucracy is very slow 
but it keeps going and going and going and going. And they gather more and more information, they get more informants, they get more conspirators on, on the indictments. And that's how they build these complex cases up. I mean, my case was classified as a complex case, over 100 people. It, it took about, um, I didn't do my plea bag until the beginning of the third year. They were still arresting people then. So these things can go on and on and on. Um, but even though it is a very small chance it will go to trial, I would love to see that. Because if Maxwell did name some big names at trial, certain government agencies would then have to take action upon those names. But it won't get there. She will be silenced either legally or she will be epstein Do you think Jeffrey Epstein's still alive? You know what? Lynn Wood sent some stuff about that. It went quite viral on my channel um, in January. And um, I wouldn't rule out that he's, you know, he could be down on some island with Kenneth Lay, <laughs> who was George Bush Jr.'s biggest political contributor at some point. You know, <laughs> really? Was, yeah, yeah. The guy behind the Enron fiasco. Yeah, was George Bush's single biggest contributor at some point. That, that, that it's a crime family. You got to pay the back sheesh to the mafia boss if you're running your scams when they're in the White House, where it's the Clintons, where it's the Bushes, it's the same old tricks, the same old games. And when Kenneth Lay got arrested, I think I was in um, Department of Corrections. And I said to my cellmate, Long Island, I said, this guy, this is never ever gonna get to trial. This guy was Bush's biggest contributor. Let's see what happens next. And he, he just died mysteriously, didn't he? Was it his heart or something? Really? Oh, yeah. He was Epstein, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, the, well, the, the Epstein idea of him, the theory of him being still alive, it doesn't seem that far out of the realm of possibilities. Because if I'm Jeffrey Epstein and I know people are trying to kill me, I know people want me dead because of all this compromising information I have on top world officials, on world leaders my response is going to be if I disappear or end up dead, I have contingencies in place that will re release all the information on all of you. You know what I mean? Like, like yeah. if Jeffrey Epstein, that would be, I would, and I would imagine that would be one of the top two things on his li priority list to have in place if he got locked up. So how would they get around that? You know what I mean? They, it seems like the most logical answer is they faked his death and he got out and he's living on some island. Or they seized that information because they have the technology that's so advanced that they would get that. And people I've interviewed believe that they do have that and Ghislaine's treasure trove already. And then they went in there. And if you look at the crime scene photo, there's an electrical cord on the floor. They use that electrical cord to strangle him and that's what caused the damage to the hyoid bone which is more common in homicide than suicide and then they strung him up to make it look like a suicide so i'm about 90 percent believing the the uh he was epstein and and 10 percent um that he's on some island with kenneth lay yeah but if even if they did get that information off a, off whatever off a hard drive let's say how would they be able to, how do they know how many copies are out there or how to destroy? They would have to destroy the other evidence after they got their copy of it. All right. So let's say that Epstein was working for the intelligence community as a honey trap and his boss was Wexner, which is what Maria Farmer, the victim has said. Then if Epstein was just a mid-level manager in that operation. Wexner was the Victoria's Secret guy? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, he was the, um, what's the other company as well? Um, she, I can't remember it off the top of my head. Was it Victoria's Secrets? Um, oh, any, anyway, yeah, Victoria, I think it was Victoria's Secrets, yeah, was one of them. Um, so if Wexner is, is, you know, the boss of this honey trap operation and he's clicked up with the intelligence community and Epstein was just a mid-level manager, then I think that information could be contained by the intelligence community. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I feel like it, it wouldn't be too hard for him to make copies of stuff and, and distribute it, you know, to have just something in place to, to save his own life. 
Yeah, but if you had the information, you just saw what happened to Epstein, what would you do with it? I would go leave it on the doorsteps of the New York Times or something like that. You know, somehow. Yeah, but that street's camered up, isn't it? They will. I would be shitting my fucking pants. That's what I would be doing. I'd if Epstein, fight. yeah, I guess. But if Epstein, I mean, you, you would think that Epstein would do something to to pay those people to to figure out a way to get that to the public, you know, anonymously. I don't know. I think it would have happened if they yeah. had that balls to do that and they had yeah. the information. I think someone would have released something. Yeah, I think it's been contained. Hmm. Because they've got all the money and all the technology in the world against little players. So nothing's going to happen to her. Maxwell will do some prison time because she's going to have to. She, other, otherwise, um, everyone's going to just say there is no fucking justice in the world. How can this right, woman right. who trafficked hundreds or maybe thousands of victims and participated in sexual assaults get a pass because she's buddy with Prince Andrew and Bill Clinton? Right, she's going to have to do something, and the, the lawyers are going to say, "Look, you know that this is so serious; these charges are so serious. You've got to do some time." It's just how much she does. Mm -hmm. It's a, so. Are you every day online just like keeping track of every document that's filed? <laughs> you I are. Even, you? I can't even take a break. The minute I try and take a break. <laughs> There's breaking Epstein news. It's the case that never goes down because there's so many people involved and it's spreading. Jean-Luc Bunnell, Maxwell. Oh, the other guy I forgot to mention was, was Peter Nygaard who was doing these pamper parties. He was drugging girls up, taking their passports and raping them anally after they'd been you know, promised these jobs as, as models and whatever. Again, another good old pal of Prince Andrew. Um, he's been down there on the island and this guy's own sons are in the indict, uh, charging him with sexual, they were sexually abused. The dad thought it was a good idea, a rite of passage to have a sex worker fuck his teenage sons so that they were no longer virgins. <laughs> <sighs> Oh my! So he bought a hooker for his kids. Yeah. Wow. How old were they? They were in like the I think the middle or low teens. Oh my god. Yeah. And who? How is this guy connected to Epstein? No, he's not. He's connected to Prince Andrew. Prince he Andrew, has, got you. He had he had his he had an island down there um, near where Epstein's island was as well uh, in the, you know that part of the world. So he was another Bahamian billionaire and um in charge of a, of a, a massive um company let me just look it up again you'll have you'll have heard of it out of canada i believe i wonder what they're doing with jeffrey epstein's island okay so they got this thing where they're trying to give up give the compensation to the victims mm. but they said they just run out of cash so Good the man. island, the island is going to have to be, you know, um, liquidated if they want to keep paying these victims and, and the lawyer fees that are ongoing. Holy shit! Yeah. How much money do they get for the island? Um, I, I can't remember how much it's worth. Um, last time I looked at uh, the value of Epstein's assets has actually gone up approximately hundred million since he died. Nygaard's, Nygaard's visitors over the years at his island included Michael Jackson. George H.W. Bush, Robert De Niro, and Prince Andrew. What? It's, it's called Nygaard K. Nygaard K. Yeah, yeah. Um, a fourth, in 1987, he built a 14,000 square meter compound at Lyford K in the Bahamas, part, partly destroyed by fire on November 10, 2009. The K is inspired by the Mayan civilization's architecture. One of the major buildings is a 3,000 square meter grand hall with a 45 ton glass ceiling. And this guy's still alive? Yeah, he's old now. He's 79 and he's in prison. He was rated the 70th richest Canadian uh, in 2009 with a net worth of 817 million. And now he's in prison in the US or, or where? Yeah, he's facing extradition to the US. Okay, okay. Yeah, six allegations of rape made against him, all under 16. 
well, I interviewed Ryan Dawson, who just got deplatformed from YouTube, and he was talking about how they were just taking these girls' passports and drugging them up and sodomizing them. Jeez, who is this guy? Ryan Dawson, you said? Yeah, Ryan Dawson. He's he's out of Japan. He's a good guy. He's an activist. What? Why did he get deplatformed? Um, Too many um, these kinds of videos. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to ask him that. I'm not exactly sure what what um, he got his strikes on what what videos. Oh my god! Yeah. I'd love to see a podcast with uh, David Ike and Alex Jones. <clears throat> oh, we need that, don't we? I mean, I think they have done some. Um, they did a Zoom, I think, or something like that. Did they? Cam- yeah, there's something. On, there was something online, but I imagine that all got wiped out with the great deplatforming. That would be absolutely bonkers. And yeah. you just did an uh, interview with that guy, uh, John Sweeney, and he has a whole podcast dedicated to Epstein and Maxwell and, and that whole story, right? So, with, so like, he, the he, BBC. His, his podcast became the number one podcast in the UK. It was really. Called, it's called Hunting Galen. So my interview of him is called hunting galane maxwell's john sweeney if people want to check that out i thought i knew a lot about maxwell but he spent many years um dedicated to that and i learned a lot from john sweeney really there were things i was wondering about and he, he filled in those blanks what was the biggest revelation or the biggest thing that he uncovered in your mind so he talked about maxwell galane maxwell's upbringing and he just went into you know a vivid description of how dysfunctional it was under Robert Maxwell, who was this charismatic media tycoon, but he was also an absolute monster and a psychopath in many ways. And because he was so charming, people who were close to him, you know, when they said he's like he's a monster, he's a psychopath, they said, "Well, at least he's our monster, or at least he's our psychopath." But apparently Ghislaine was subjected to corporal punishment and there was a selection of belts. And looking at what happened later on, you know, books that were found in Epstein's properties, like the Marquis de Sade, this uh, BDSM stuff, a lot of what happens to us when we're kids carries forward into our adult lives. So this... BDSM propensity, it seems that a root cause is possibly the, the 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 beltings and the corporal punishment that she got from her dad, who she idolized, and he was her favorite as well out of all of the kids. Who some of them became hugely successful, some of them died. There was all it's like a, 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 um, a Greek tragedy. What what happened to the kids? What happened? How many brothers and sisters does she have? Um. A lot? Quite a lot, quite really? a lot. Let me just have a look right now. We could see how her behavior was shaped by the treatment that came from her father. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, Sweeney was quite sympathetic in respect that he was saying that that was a mitigating circumstance, you know, for Maxwell because of this dysfunctional um, upbringing. Nine children. Nine. Nine children he had. So if you want to hear the crazy stuff that happened to these um, these kids. So Michael was the oldest brother. He fell into a coma age 15 after a car crash in 1961 and died eight years later, having never regained consciousness. So imagine you're Ghislaine and your brother is just on life support and he can't even communicate with you. So that is really sad. Eight years? Eight years. Philip, 71. Um, Poor Philip, he was described by as his friends, became a brilliant scientist and mathematician, won a scholarship to Balliol College, Oxford at just 16. But he so hated his father that as soon as he could, he fled to Argentina to get as far away from him as possible. They fell out when he married Nilda, an Argentinian, in 1977 against his dad's wishes. The marriage didn't last. Nilda moved out, taking their daughter Marcella with her, and a second marriage also failed. He was last heard of living in a £65 a week flat, that is a $100 a week apartment in North London, trying to be a writer. 
And what was he writing about? His bullying father. And 69 became an actress and she was called ugly by her father. God. When her fledgling acting career floundered, her dad said, what have you and Pope John Paul II got in common? You are both ugly and you are both failed actors. This is how crazy that guy was. Jesus Christ. She studied Italian and French at Oxford, trained at a, as a Montessori teacher, married an osteopath, and is now believed to be a hypnotist in Surrey, practicing under a different name. Um, she kept out of the limelight since her father's death in 1968. So I'm in Surrey. I might try and get a hold of her. Oh, this is a good one. Christine, so you saw some of them um, didn't do very well, but these did. Christine and her sister Isabel made the Sunday Times rich list in 1999 after amassing a hundred million pounds during the dot com bubble. But then they lost it all. But now they're back up again or something. It's crazy. Jeez, man. Yeah, yeah. Um, where, where are they all? Where was the, uh, what was the dad's name again? Robert Maxwell? Robert Maxwell. Where was he? Where where did he live? Where was he based at? Was he in the uh, UK? So he was out of Czechoslovakia. Oh, okay. And his entire family were wiped out in the Holocaust. Mm. But his mom said to him, get to England and copy the mannerisms of an English gentleman. And that's what he did. Interesting. Oh, there was, here's a weird death. Isabel, the second twin, she um, got together with an illusionist, a third husband illusionist, Al Seckel, a significant player in the California literary acad acad academic and celebrity scene, was famous for holding parties for the great and good and was a good friend of Epstein. In 2009, the two organized a science conference called Mind Shift on Epstein's private island. Isabel and Seckel married in Malibu in 2007, but the union was never legal as he'd forgotten to file the papers to annul the second of three previous marriages. Um, but here's what happens to him. Um, in 2015, Seckle was found dead below a cliff near their home in the village of Saint Cirque La Popie in France's Lot Valley. And Isabel still lives in the south of France. Was he Epstein in 2015? <laughs> Somebody needs HBO needs to do a documentary on the Maxwell family. That here's, would be fucking bonkers. Here's an even sadder one. Kareen, the middle sister, age free in 1957 died of leukemia oh oh no it goes man it's endless the sister yeah it's someone... a tragic a tragic history from that family kevin became britain's biggest ever bankruptcy oh <laughs> 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 on, on, on it goes yeah wow i wanted to ask you before we end this thing uh, I did a podcast with Wilford Wong. It's one of like my biggest podcasts. Oh, it's got, a, yeah, it's well, got like almost a half a million views on it. Um, you emailed me right when he got arrested. He got arrested for apparently he claims he was trying to catch some some one of these satanic cults who are preying on children. What happened with him? All right. So Wilford Wong was arrested with a group of people, including the mom of the kid that they had taken from social services and these uh these are the kind of uh stories that are causing problems legal problems for people so i'm going to word things very carefully i want to say that you know the mother obviously believed that her kid was getting abused in car and wilford they had a car with false license plates and i think he had a knife in his possession we absolutely do not advocate that people take matters into their own hands and snatch kids from the authorities because Wilfred is facing a massive prison sentence now for abduct abducting a child. One of his co-defendants was found dead already in the prison. Yeah. And um, I have had a letter from Wilfred, which I read out on my channel. 
And I also recently published a four hour, 15 minute podcast with John Wedger, who had referred Wilford to us in the first place, who is in telephone communication with Wilford. And he has communicated uh, Wilford's uh, story and wishes through that medium. So there's a trial coming up and Wilfred is protesting his innocence, asking people to write to the government in Wales and is going to be taking it to trial. So we are awaiting the outcome of that. But again, I reiterate, people do not uh, follow in Wilfred's footsteps and snatch kids from the authorities. And you know, you're gonna end up with a massive prison time if you do anything like that. Yeah, the, the one thing that I was that I questioned about Wilfred, I know a lot of people talk about the SRA and the satanic ritual abuse that that happens, but the weirdest thing was there's no solid evidence of it ever happening. There's no like footage or video or or anything. And he's like a like a a very devoted Christian, right? Like he, he's he's very involved in like a like a bunch of Christian organizations and does a lot of work within that religion, which it, it just seems interesting that he's so devoted to catching these Satanists. There are some cases documented that people can find online of people who've been charged with crimes that were a part of satanic rituals, mm -hmm. but it's not, you know, everyday an everyday thing. That we see correct yeah right i mean is there is there any actual like video or footage and there's like the whole bohemian grove thing where where uh they, they had like a fake child's body a fake body or whatever that they were sacrificing but is there ever has there ever been any actual evidence found well there's all kinds of things available online showing macabre crimes um snuff movies red rooms there's all kinds of horror story stuff going on and perhaps you know people who believe in good and evil would say that that you know those are satanic enterprises in themselves but i know what you're saying like like there's people there's people who love the theatrics of it of, yeah, of worshiping definitely. the devil you know what i mean definitely. it's it's a fun thing for some people like there's metal bands who who sacrifice fake people on stage and people think it's exciting and fun and whatever it's rebellious isn't it for young people yeah as well to do you know gothic and uh yeah yeah so you know how much of it is out there i have no idea i'm no expert on this subject mm -hmm. yeah but it's fun to it's fun to uh, investigate and talk about it certainly is yeah i've, I've interviewed quite a few people on it cool man well thank you for doing this uh, i wish we had longer but this was super exciting and fun it's always cool. a pleasure. Any uh, anything specific we want to talk? You want to uh, have people go to like any specific videos you got going on, or well, any you know, new if books? You, if, if you if you put the link to my channel in the description box, that's the thing I appreciate the most. It's free to subscribe to my channel. We're almost that coming up to seven hundred thousand subs now. Really appreciate all the people who've jumped on there. And I've got about fifteen books available. They're available worldwide on Amazon. Just put my name in S H A U N A T T Wood. <laughs> whether it's you know my jail story or stuff we write about the cia and epstein new book coming out about epstein who killed epstein prince andrew or bill clinton we're gonna have prince andrew and bill clinton on the front cover of that that's fucking great um other than that you, you know if it's just going from strength to strength um just putting we're doing a, a weekly live stream right now called atwood unleashed with some of this more sensitive content and we've got two true crime podcasts um, coming out every week, one on Monday night and one on Thursday night as well. So all on your main channel, the Sean Atwood channel. All on the main channel, and okay. uh, you know, Danny, just really appreciate you having me on, and uh, it's always a pleasure.